Hey everyone, I think we're live. Uh, and Carrie's here. Let me make sure you're unmuted, Carrie. Are you unmuted? I can't hear you, so then maybe you're still muted. Why? Why would you be muted? You are muted. How about now, Carrie? Try now. Can you hear me? Yes. So right. I was pulling up the YouTube link because I was trying to tweet out. And it did the same thing it did last time when I was fixing my hair. I know. <laughs> no, it's you, and I have no idea. Like, I I do all the things on this end that I tell it to not show you, but it was showing you, so. You're showing me looking all concerned, like, because I'm trying to find the link. And that's embarrassing. <laughs> you know what? Uh, there might be a way to fix this a little bit more. You know what we need to do is... Uh, yeah, we just need to upgrade a lot of equipment. Who's awfully quiet, by the way? Is it one of us or is it uh, both of us that are quiet? Someone in chat saying we're quiet. Are you still there? I oh, we're you. fine now. Okay, cool. Sorry, I was okay. muted because I was an idiot. Okay, oh. guys, we're gonna get this together. We we just we just finished recording Daily Cafefe, which won't be out until later, and it just a quick turnaround. And anyway, thanks for joining us. You're watching Deprogrammed on Unsafe Space. Oh yeah, we we're supposed to do our whole intro. Welcome to Deprogrammed on Unsafe Space. Like, share, subscribe. Go to Subscribe Star. Buy stuff. Get a mug. You can uh, apostate level or above. Get a mug for free. Free in quotes, which you're paying for. Uh, there's merch. There's shirts Carrie loves. Uh, anything you can do will help solve our technical problems and other problems. Uh, we can produce better content. So someday Carrie will not have to have another job and my bank account will stop bleeding. Someday. Someday. Ah, all right. Carrie, today we want to talk about one of, I think, your favorite, your favorite, favorite topics. Um, yeah, we've just been kind of going through the list of uh, SJW concepts lately on Deprogrammed. And I think people are liking that, right? We talked about... Uh, I like it. Yeah, we, we kind of go through these things that we talked about their uh, definition, their, their attempted redefinition of racism and sexism, prejudice plus power. Um, but yeah, today we're talking about Robin DeAngelo who in 2011 coined the term white fragility. White fragility, dun, dun, dun. I want to see the definition according to, according to her? Yes, please. All right, well, not that you need it, Carrie. I know you're steeped in the lore, <laughs> but for everyone else like me, who did not grow up in social justice, this is from her, this is her, uh, White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. She's got a book. Uh, this is just a, a little article, I guess. Um, okay. White Fragility is a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. These moves include an outward display of emotion such as anger, fear, and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, <laughs> silence, and leaving the stress inducing situation isn't argumentation the best you can't you can't even that's the that's the best on the whole list it's like if someone if you say someone is a uh, racist and they they respond to you by making an argument that they're not racist well that's just evidence that they are <laughs> well carrie like, i think you're the entire point of the term uh that is the that is the key component is argumentation uh, because the entire term white fragility is basically an ad hominem and it's designed to ensure that you never have to defend anything you say. You can just throw white fragility back. And so the natural thing to do in any conversation is to argue or to question or to like have a dialogue. But as soon as a white person tries to have a dialogue that, oh, it's on the list, argumentation, you're arguing, done. I've labeled you white fragile over so i i i missed part of that because my i accidentally pulled my headphone jack out but uh i think what you're saying think anything you didn't know yeah but i caught the end of it and i think what you're saying is that 
this is this is one of the most amazing SJW concepts because it's a circular argument. It's basically any response you have at all is is considered evidence of white fragility. There's no appropriate response other than to acquiesce and say, "Oh, you're right," and how can I be absolved? Right? Like you you have to agree with the person, and it's meant to stop stop any type of engagement. Yeah, what I was saying is basically it's just an ad hominem slash form of bullying. Yeah. And, and it's and the most important component of that definition is the part that says argumentation, because um, that's the part that matters to them. It's that if you have any question about what they're claiming, any uh, rational discussion or like, well, what about this? Or I'm not sure about that or blah, blah, blah. Any kind of conversation that's not abject acceptance, prima facie of what they're saying, bam, they can throw white fragility in your face and the conversation's done and they've labeled you a fragile white person and you're done. That was kind of my point. Yes, uh -huh. so it just, yeah, it's it's meant to just, um, anytime anybody uses this and you'll see it a lot more now, they use it just like with white privilege or toxic masculinity or whatever, they use it as if it's a statement of fact, as if it's something that is provable and that the, as if there's a body of evidence or there's any, they, they say it like it's gravity, right? Like, oh, white fragility. Um, consider it in an argument, I would say, or consider it like a magic word, like we've talked about. They I was use just the, gonna say that, Carrie, it's yeah. a magic word, yes. They have a list of magic words and this is one of their magic words and treat it as such, don't give it, they want you to retreat, they want you to treat it with respect as if it's something that you both agree exists and- um, The real thing, you, yeah. Right, and the minute you do that, you've already seeded ground that you think this is a concept that is valid, which I don't. It's also, it is an incredibly racist term and you can point that out. I think one of the great things about um, arguing with SJWs is that if you're talking to one who's a true believer, who has good intent, you can, you can find that common ground of what you both agree on, which is if they're really in it for the right reasons, they've been brainwashed into thinking that this is about opposing racism. And this is one of the ways they do it. A lot of times it's white SJWs who are, who are repeating these concepts like white fragility because that's how they prove they're a non-racist white ally, right? And- um, Well, and Robin D'Angelo, just to be clear, she was white. Right. So look at that. Look at the S history of SJWs we've talked about so far. You've got Peggy McIntosh, a very wealthy elite white woman who coins the concept white privilege. You've got, um, gosh, what was the last one we did? Uh, prejudice. Well, there was the woman who shot Andy Warhol that you were reading a lot of her thing. Um, oh, but yeah, but that's a sad, she didn't really coin anything. The woman that coined the prejudice plus power. Oh, yeah. I forget her name, but she was also white. White woman. Robin D'Angelo coins the term white fragility, white Probably woman. Probably because Robin D'Angelo is bad at arguing and she thought maybe inventing a new magic phrase would be would help her, and it has. Well, it's, it's also just a form of, um, look, it, this whole thing is a virtue signaling thing. You're, you're in a cult, you're in a cult of belief, you're in a religion that tells you you are born with an innate sin because you're white, right? Or because you're male or because whatever, any of these, whatever priv privileged group you're in, um, those are all, they're almost like sins. And so what they what they do is you'll see them, this, this term we use virtue signaling a lot, but they're basically showing other SJWs, look, I'm a good, look how good I am. Look at me calling out these other people. What she's done, <laughs> About this though, than white, than like white privilege carry, right? This what? is wrong. This is there's something different in the nature of this. This is um, this is an insulting, belittling thing to say. It's derogatory, right? White privilege is like, oh, you have this privilege and you don't see it. It's also a racist concept and and a magic word. This is taking it a little step further, where like you're kind of being insulted a little bit. Oh, you're fragile. Like being fragile is is a pathetic thing to be, right? So. It's kind of, they're trying to, they got called snowflakes and so this is their version of calling people who disagree with them snowflakes where they're like, oh, you're just, you just have white fragility. You're just, you just, you're fragile. You can't, you can't handle the truth. Yes. Right? My point was going to be though that she's a professional SJW. So the reason that she's gone here, I believe is because you have, she has to make a name for herself. She can't just, she's not just virtue signaling. 
what is she going to come up with as a concept? What book is she going to sell? Do you know right. what I mean? Like, how does she prove that she's one of the, the purest of the pure? And this, that, that's how these things evolve. And, you, and these, th that's how these terms get coined. And then people go around talking about them like they're some scientific fact. And it's just, this is just some woman getting paid to, to uh, build her self-confidence as being some kind of, you know, super woke white woman. And it doesn't even work, by the way. She never feels good enough. I don't know if you, you do you remember her tweets that were recently a thing? Oh, was that her? Yeah. Wait, I'm going to look them up. But but to your point, um, yes, this is this goes a step further than white privilege. This is this is an um, I, I consider white privilege an ad hominem half the time too. the way people use it. Oh, it, it is ad hominem. But yeah, this but this is even worse. This basically says you can't you're not allowed to have any response at all. It also It's not even that you're not allowed to. It's that like you're too weak to be able to handle the truth. Right. It's it's a it's a it's more of an insult. And I think what you something you pointed out, which I think is interesting, right? If they're trying to one up each other. This is her one upping Peggy McIntosh, right? Oh, it's not just white privilege; it's white fragility, right? And you know, yeah. it's like it's like the next person will be, oh, this is just white retardation, like oh, that's even worse, right? Like maybe they, they, they won't use that word though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. This <laughs> this is I don't know, uh, white psychopathy. Um you right. will also see them use interchangeably with this is which is another insult um another racist insult they say white tears a lot um they just they say male tears a lot now it's weird because on the one hand they say that men don't show enough emotion as a result of the patri living in the patriarchy and as a, as a result of uh, living in a misogynist world that men are taught not to show emotion. But then if you are a man who shows emotion, it's like they mock motion, emotion at the same time by using male tears. Um, but they do the same thing with, they, they will say white tears. And so the weird thing, when I've had arguments with people who wholeheartedly have bought into this stuff, if they explain, sometimes it starts with them explaining the new definition of racism to you, right? Like, oh, look, I used to be like you, white person, but then someone taught me that um, I have to look to a person of color to explain what racism is because I don't have a working brain and I can't figure out things on my own. And this new race, this new definition makes it impossible to be racist towards white people. And this new definition is prejudice plus power. And then you say, I don't, I don't agree with that definition. I fully understand it. I used to believe in it, but I don't agree with it. And then they say, whoa, whoa, now you're expressing white fragility. I'm like, <laughs> right. it's just a series of magic words. <laughs> and I think, I mean, look, insulting magic words, you know, racist insulting magic phrases shouldn't work on you. Uh, yeah. And that's all it is, right? So, um, you but, point out something in chat, Carrie, which is, which is, goes back to Vox Day's thing. SJWs always project right they use the word fragile i think it's i think it's in response to the word snowflake i think it's precisely because people have pointed out how fragile they are and they just project that like no no it's it's you that's fragile it was just like the that twitter thread the other day that we were talking about with the the woman who was talking to her uh white teenagers uh or teenage son about comedy and blah 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 and she was like it's uh what does she say oh it's um you're not being edgy by saying things that are taboo. We're being edgy by dismantling racism, like by talking about systemic racism, that's edgy. It's like everything, you know, uh, ev everything that they're doing, they just kind of project. Are you looking up those tweets? Is that what's happening? I am currently looking up those tweets, but you're right, they do project and they are racist. And so I, could, I think I lost my train of thought earlier about when you're arguing with an SJW who has good, good intent, and who believes in this, um, I would point that out. Like they're not gonna, they're gonna knee jerk disagree because they've now been brainwashed into believing that racism has this other special meaning that excludes um, certain, that excludes people on the basis of race. That's what's hilarious. There's this new definition right. of racism. Well, certain races can not be racist and other races are inherently racist and other races cannot be the target of racism. And it all depends on their race. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. I want to cut that out and make a little clip that we. It all depends on their race. How uh, do we decide? Let's look at their race. And so, <laughs> and so. Anyway, I would, I would, I would appeal to that though, because if they are of, if they are of good intent, 
and I like to assume good faith until someone proves otherwise in a conversation, but um, go ahead and assume good faith and talk to them in good faith and then in, until they prove that they're operating in bad faith. But um, I would appeal to that, say, look, I'm, I'm opposed to using terms like this because it's racist, because you are stigmatizing something, uh, any, any behavior, any response at all on the basis of race. You're saying, uh, because you are this race, therefore making an argument, uh, getting emotional, um, defending yourself, uh, just disagreeing at all, all of those things are um, evidence of some inherent badness in you, some inherent racism. That's, that's a racist concept. So. Obviously, yeah. I mean, uh, wait, I, I lost my train. I thought I was going to say. Okay. I lo- no, no, I, I love what you're saying. Um, oh, I know. I want to just make up. It's fun to be able to predict where this stuff is going. Uh, and I, my argument here is that the fundamental thing that we have to pay attention to, and I know we said, like people have said this for a while, not just us, people have said this for a long time, um, but it sounds too ridiculous to believe. And that is, they think reason and logic are, are the wrong epistemological tools to use to, to, to ascertain knowledge. And I know that sounds like weirdly philosophical, but they are, they do not value reason. They think reason is an invention of the white oppressive patriarchy. They, they literally don't think rational argument is superior epistemologically to their feelings or social metaphysics or whatever else. So what you see here is they're inventing tools. White privilege is just a tool to avoid having to use rational arguments to make your point. Well, you have white privilege, so you can't understand. White fragility is just a tool. It's a, it's a little bit more, uh, it's a sharper tool. It's a little bit nastier, but it's, oh, you're too fragile to understand the truth. All of these are tools to avoid having a rational discussion, a discussion based on reason and evidence. Because when the discussion is based on reason and evidence, they lose, they know they lose, they know they have nothing to offer. If the, if the arena is reason and evidence, they know they're dead. So they've got to make, they've got to construct a different arena and steer you into it. And I think as this escalates, I think what's going to happen is eventually they're they're going to start using that language a little bit more explicitly. And they'll be like, they'll start saying something that amounts to denigrating reason as such openly, right? You've already heard a little bit of it, you know, you know, uh, logic is white, blah, blah, blah. But there, I think there, someone will coin a term that's like, derogatory about rational thought yes they that you're exactly right they've already started attacking the concepts of logic and reason so in academia so these things trickle down you get academics these buffoons i'm not talking about actual intellectual minds (laughs) and i know that sounds that's an insult i don't mean to but you get these buffoons who come up with these concepts and then they trickle down from academia and so they're already in academia it's percolating that uh, reason itself, logic itself, like these are all somehow part of a patriarchal, heterosexist, white supremacist uh, s- culture. And well, this, this is why I rail against philosophy. Philosophers, the bad philosophers that are the uh, foundation of a lot of this, they've been saying this for a century or more. <laughs> like they've been attacking reason for a long, long, long time, it just, it's trickling into now you're getting in mainstream culture terms that are intended to evade using reason as the standard. And and like like I said, I think they'll start attacking it openly. Jason, what, um, so Jason in the chat says standpoint epistemology. Uh, I don't know what that means. It's an interesting sounding term. What is standpoint epistemology, Jason, if you wanna tell us uh, I've not heard that term before. <laughs> Reasonists, yeah. Uh, I grew up in the 60s and 70s when the goal was to bring everybody together as one people, the human race, what happened? <laughs> uh, 
I don't know, Joe. I don't know that that was actually the goal. I think that's the goal that they told you while they were passing the joint. But no, I but I think that was the goal of a lot of people. I agree with Joe, who are part of this. Like that was a goal. And then Martin Luther King, that was his goal. Like it wasn't. That was the goal of a lot of the people, but I don't know that it was ever really the goal of the people leading these movements. Maybe. So I was looking for the tweets that I was talking about were Rob, Rob, the recent Robin D'Angelo ones. But in the process, I found this amazing um one from Chloe Valdery. Uh, let me just I'll put see. it up. Yeah, let me see. Okay, guys, I'm struggling with technology here. Okay, I, I do agree. So here's where I will agree with Joe. And actually, someone else mentioned this. Uh, as late as the 90s, we did talk about trying to have like colorblind society as being a positive thing and view people as individuals that has dried up. Um, but I, again, I think the reason for that is the philosophy was never really there uh, underneath it. Okay, what do you got here, Carrie? So Chloe Valdery says, the premise of Robin DeAngelo's book, White Fragility, is not simply that white people are fragile, but even more sinisterly, that black people are, which is true yes. if you think about it. That yes. what, this, what she's saying is that black people are so fragile that they can't possibly hear you disagree with them or... Yep. And and not just that black people are, but 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 it's that people in this SJW ideology are. People in this SJW ideology cannot hear your disagreement. They can't handle it. They don't know how to engage with it. So they make up terms like white fragility so they can write you off completely. They wake up. They make up terms for people like for, for people who are not white who disagree with them. For people like Candace Owens, to use an example, they make up terms like internalized racism. They call her um, all manner of racial slurs and they say she's internalized her own oppression. So they have like these key, these magic phrases to explain your very disagreement, but to avoid engaging with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, to, it's to justify. So what they want to do is ignore you, scream, run away not engage with you, but they have to justify it otherwise, because if they don't justify it somehow, they'll look bad. So they need to have a magic phrase. Oh, uh, white fragility, now I can run, right? Now I can, I can leave and now. Then, and then <laughs> they get to rest on their laurels because it's like, it's an academic concept, guys. Yeah, yes, I said white fragility. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you heard of white fragility? There's more than one <laughs> syllable in white fragility. <laughs> <laughs> are you rubbing your stomach and patting your head <laughs> i'm just patting i want to pat my back but i don't know if you'll see it so i'm, I'm like patting my head i don't know i'm um, insane okay so can we jason start? mentioned standpoint um epistemology and he says that standpoint theory uh the most important concept is that an individual's own perspectives are shaped by his or her social and political experiences carrie to me that sounds kind of like the lived experience thing is that right yeah, it is. They 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 believe in again. They they put logic and reason way down here. Lived experience here, emotion here, and yeah, it's all a part of that. Can we show the bingo card? Yes. Um, so I wanna, this someone, someone mentioned by the way, this was it was exactly Martin Luther King's dream to grow up in a colorblind society. Yeah, he, he did explicitly say that. I will also though say Martin Luther King had a lot of, like politically, had a lot of Marxist ideology in his thought process. And so uh, I think the, the evil seeds of, of Marxism and dividing people into groups have been kind of percolating, uh, this is a mixed metaphor, but they've been kind of percolating e even in people like, I, I agree with MLK's, you know, I have a dream speech, we, we all have heard that, we, like that's a, a noble thing, but when it comes to politics, a, a lot of people were still operating under some collectivist premises, even if they weren't racially collectivist, they were collectivist in some other way. And so that's kind of been percolating for a while. So it's not, this collectivism isn't new. It's just, it's just that now they're kind of applying it directly to race openly rather than, you know, fighting it racially. Um, you you want to show, so Carrie, this white fragility card, I, well, I have a question about it. Well, well so a friend said, is, is it okay to put her name up? She says that like... Yeah. Okay. 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 A friend sent this to me. It is public. It is a public okay. post. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> Sorry. I'm I, I, no, I, I just, I like, I felt a little bit weird because it's like someone's Facebook page and I was like, I don't know. Like, it, it, she's she does horrible. this for a living. So let's put this All up. Right. So um, it would be like somebody critiquing our video. And of course I just didn't want to dox someone that would, like, I didn't want to be, I wanted just to question. That's all. Okay. A friend sent this to me. Is. It's, if you're saying it's public and it's her job, fine. Great. We'll do it. Okay. Put it up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can we talk about it now? <laughs> okay. Carter and I get. I don't, I don't, maybe I'm taking some weird. I don't know what I ate this morning. Um, you you want me to put it up? Or are you putting it up? Yeah, I thought you were going to, but. Oh, okay. I was waiting for you to put it up. That's why I was. Okay. So um, here it is. This is this person's name. I guess we'll say is Ali Henny. And Carrie, you're saying this is her job. This is what she does. This is a professional SJW, and and this is a public post. And of course, like it's not like taking a friend's private post on their private wall and sharing it. So anyway, it would be the same as somebody sharing our video and critiquing it. Okay. So this is she's trying to educate you with this. So it, it let's be educated. Um, it has been shared countless times. People love it. Uh, the comments. I was laughing at it at first. So a friend sent it to me. I was laughing at it, but then I was reading through the comments. And it really hurt my heart because there's all these supposedly, I mean, I, I presumably well-intentioned white people in here and the comments are just like, one of them's like, I'm going to recommend this to my elementary school uh, staff for a staff training. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So should we, so, should we read what this says here? Yeah. Can, everyone, can everyone see it on the screen? I just, I'm a little bit concerned about this weirdness that's happening, but um, yeah, it's, it's this white fragility bingo. And uh, we want to just, do we want to read the bingo or the thing she wrote about it? Um, let's read the thing she wrote about it. So presenting white fragility bingo. Some people are visual learners and need to have their problematic behavior illustrated for them, sometimes literally. I create tools like this and some of the other self-tests that I have done to engage people on different levels and in different ways. Notice she's saying engage people, but this is about not engaging. Right, by the way, Carrie, one of the things I, I think is funny here, she's like, I create tools like this, blah, 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 blah. And immediately I thought, we create tools like this as a joke when we're watching the democratic debates. Like this, this, yeah. is, your, this is your big academic, this is your big contribution to society is you used a randomized bingo thing to stick in some stupid phrases. <laughs> like, yeah, and to engage. But what it really is, is to tell you that any response you have is wrong. Uh, on one level, I think these types of things are empowering for black and brown folks because it's a way to call attention to and hopefully shut down. No, that, there, there's some honesty there. Shut down unsavory behavior. What's unsavory? Well, any disagreement. Uh, that, that's me adding that. Even but. questioning is unsavory. Like even just asking questions, because you can destroy these people, Carrie, just by asking questions. Even that's unsavory. Yeah. It's also a constructive and educational way to be petty. Now, I love that she says she's being petty here. Like what? you said, this this concept of white fragility is like you like you pointed out, it was a great point. It's different from white privilege in that it's an insult. It and and she's basically relishing in being petty. It's a constructive and educational way to be petty. Is she saying that as a joke? No. No, they they when I when I Word petty means yes yes they like to be okay so sjw's are some of the most petty um oh. sarcastic rude yeah. people in conversation and it's it's not frowned upon they don't frown upon it it's viewed as um you know reading you or um th there's this whole thing about like slapping people down as you see these claps all the time you know the the clap emoji they they relish it it's it seem it's it's viewed as just, especially when it's done by someone who's in a marginalized group. To be petty, to be petty is viewed as good. Yes, <laughs> to be insulting, to slap someone down, you know, to tell someone off, whatever. They're very dismissive. They use a lot of the same catchphrases. That's, some, of the, some of these uh, things that have developed as like online, online catchphrases and memes, some of the ones that used to be funny, I can't even use anymore because I, SJWs use them all the time. It's in, in place of having an actual dialogue or having an act, something interesting to say. And so a, a great example is the phrase by Felicia, 
from the movie Friday. I, I oh, love that. Yeah. Like by Felicia, like done, like I'm not engaging with you, but they, you, they overuse it. They use it all the time. Right. And it just- I they, only see it used as a joke, like not by non-SJW, but I've used it, I've seen it used as like a funny thing. Like SJW uses it all the time. You'll, they'll say blah, 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 your privilege and fragility. And you'll say, I disagree with that. And they'll be like, bye Felicia. <laughs> <laughs> um they they also say oh gosh what's another one they say that i can't say? oh this is one of the reasons i i think people I, I try not to use sarcasm i still use it a lot but i try to use it less because they lean on sarcasm like a crutch because they don't actually they can't they don't speak a lot of truth they, they're not in touch with truth they're they're repeating tenets of a belief system they're just they're just searching through concepts in their head and they're pulling the right phrases to try and win they're not actually thinking and they're certainly not engaging in truth. And so one of the things they do is they, they use sarcasm as a crutch and they use this one phrase a lot that I used to think was funny and now I don't because I see them use it all the time. They're like, they'll ask something really sarcastically or mean and then they'll say, asking for a friend. <laughs> oh, Have you seen that? asking for a friend. Yes, yes. I'm like, what? no, you're not. You're asking for yourself. Just, just be honest. Like, why do you, they say a lot of that, that, if you if you start to listen to the way they they speak which i find i find that stuff fascinating you know i watch a lot of police interrogation videos because i like to see how the ways people lie and like their various tells they speak so many lies and it's so interesting to like, like they'll say asking for a friend i know that seems like a meaningless thing but it, they can't even for me it's representative of the fact that they can't stand by their their words they overuse sarcasm because they can't say truthful things so yeah um yeah no I, I i i think again kind of getting back to um i think we talked about this this morning but in our interview with gina we gorlin we, you know we talked about how uh continuing to do one be in one particular mode of thought makes it actually a little bit difficult to switch modes and so if they're continuing to practice self-deception it gets it gets pretty difficult to start actually practicing what she would call cognitive integrity and start um, or and, and stop kind of evading what's going on. So I imagine that the the brain of someone who does this gets pretty jumbled over time because it's totally inconsistent and it's like cognitive dissonance every two seconds and it's not consistent with a whole bunch of evidence that you see in reality. It's got to be kind of a confusing and I, I imagine anxiety producing uh, philosophy. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, just from personal experience, I, I've talked about this before, but it was, I would be shifting through all the tenets of the belief system and trying to pick the appropriate ones. I, I would view it almost as someone who, look, let's do an analogy to um, Christianity. It would be like someone for whom the words of scripture have no real meaning and they haven't thought through what they mean. They're just shifting through Bible verses, looking for the one that's going to shut you up. It would be like that. Some well, actually, that's the way I think a lot of denominations evolve. <laughs> like there's that's, that's churches tend to like, when they get woke, they, they do exactly that. Hmm. Interesting. Right. They, they like, they, just, they, they cherry pick the stuff that matches their philosophy. Right. That make, that's interesting. Well, yeah, so, but that's, that's what it's like. And it is anxiety producing and so many SJWs self-censor because they're afraid of saying the wrong thing or stepping in it and not being pure enough. And they, they're not, um, I, th I think it lends itself to just uh, being dishonest with yourself in, in a multitude of ways because your entire foundational belief system is dishonest. And so yeah. what's you don't know what's up and what's down like I, I think a lot of people like a lot of sjw's i know are miserable people and they alternate these virtue signaling sjw posts or trump hating posts or whatever with posts about like all their different mental disorders and insomnia and what kind of drugs are you on and anybody have a recommendation for they they are really a lot of them not not all of them but the ones who are vocal about all their depression and stuff like that they're they're, um, and, and even in per my personal life, a lot of the SJWs I know are just like really deeply unhappy people. But I think that comes from being, you're not grounded in anything that's real. Yeah. I mean, it's probably, uh, 
it's probably a vicious cycle, right? Because it might be some anxiety and psychological issues that maybe lead you to getting caught up in virtue signaling to make yourself feel better or, 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 uh, you know, taking on the opinions of others because you don't have a lot of confidence in your own opinion. But like you said, once you start adopting those beliefs, then that just makes your whole, uh, integrity, emotional integrity and cognitive integrity, like, like starts to fracture. And so then you're more anxious and you kind of, it's like this, this vicious, this vicious cycle. Um, yeah. By um, the way, I'm gonna, go, ahead. Okay. go ahead. Um, I was going to say, I'm going to share, uh, hold on. Can I share my screen now? Would that work? I don't see why not. I okay, guess the, tell us in the chat if it doesn't work, but I have so many problems with technology. While okay, you're figuring that out, I just, um, oh, actually you've, you did figure it out. Done. Okay. okay. So let's go back to what she was saying. If yes. that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Please. So this is after she says it's a constructive and educational way to be petty. And she says on another level, these types of tools are good ways for white people to engage their own folks here. Look again, they appropriated the word folks from Southerners. <laughs> anyway, uh, for white people to engage their own folk. This is part of what you're expected to do. White people are expected to go after white people. Men are expected to go after men. In fact, I, I would see professional SJWs I was friends with online who would, who would say, I'm having an argument on this wall. Male allies, I don't have the emotional labor to deal with this. Male allies, please go in there and get your men, you know, or they'll say, go in and get your white people, get your, you know, um, Okay, so to engage their own folks by reinforcing that white people often display a pattern of behaviors in certain situations. Uh, you mean they have any response whatsoever other than kissing your butt and telling you you're right? <laughs> um, this can also serve as a self-checking tool. Yes, people can and will be snarky with these kinds of things. I'm not concerned with that as much as I am with others learning. I cannot tell you how many times I have learned things about different marginalized groups through resources like this, I've also learned things that I should avoid saying or doing. This is all about what you should avoid saying or doing. Again, you're, they're sorting through a catalog of beliefs and acceptable things to say in their head. And there are so many things they are being taught that they should avoid saying or doing. Well, guess what? That's in conflict with, with searching for truth. That's in conflict with speech, speaking truth. Of course. I hope that this bingo card will be something that people use as a way to visually represent and teach about white fragility. I hope that people will use it as a way to call attention to problematic behaviors. I hope that people who see it in comment sections and social feeds will take the time to evaluate themselves. So uh, please feel, feel free to use it and share it. Just give me attribution. So she asked for us to name her, by the way. There you go, Allie. There's your attribution. <laughs> Uh, just Hey, Carrie, can we just pause and look at a couple of the things here that I'm, yeah. I'm looking at right now? I mean, one demands evidence instead of listening. Well, like that's really, so first of all, they're using the word demands to make it sound like no one in conversation is like, I demand evidence. Like, that's not what people do. They say like, well, do you have evidence for that? That's not a demand. That's a question. And wouldn't a demand involve a gun? <laughs> yeah. Or at least an emphatic, you know, but so the demanding asking for evidence is that is an attack directly on reason, right? Like, oh, asking for evidence? Uh-uh. We can't we can't go there. Um so that's that to me, that's one of the one of the interesting ones. Um, I mean, they're all interesting. They're all designed to avoid reason and shut down, but that one actually relates directly to what you should be doing, which is discussing evidence. Yeah. Um saying that's not racist so that's that's just a disagreement then if they disagree and say that's not racist that's wrong they're not allowed to say that right um and some of the things are the things that the sjws do <laughs> shuts down and refuses to engage well i mean look you you've made you've basically said you know you bow to me or i throw ad hominems at you if someone says bye felicia to that are they shutting down and refusing to engage yeah is it fragile? Why is it white fragility? Uh, I think it's recognizing that, you know, you're not going to get anywhere with this crazy social justice person. So. Uh, starts crying after being called out. Well, I'm sure I've, that happens all the time. 
I've shared anecdotal stories though of these white women who pay to go to these crazy racist seminars of like unlearning yeah. toxic whiteness where they pay their they pay to be yelled at and told um, how evil and racist they are and if they uh, react by crying then that's just a sign of their guilt and you know um, what's another one here uh, makes themselves the victim. Wow, that sounds like projection as well. Um, here's here's one of my favorite. It tries to explain how racism works to a black or brown person. So again, they believe in this whole lived experience thing and you're only allowed to have an opinion if you belong to the quote marginalized group that's being so like men are not allowed to have an opinion on what constitutes sexism and white people are not allowed to have an opinion on what constitutes racism. And so again, this is a circular argument. It's like, well, you can't disagree. Why? Because of your race. <laughs> like right. it's totally racist. You can't disagree with me because of your race. Um, and, and it also assumes that all black and brown people have the same opinion and they don't. Like I, it, that is a very racist belief that, that all black and brown people agree they don't. Um, and if you, that's a great point to bring up to them. Again, I like to point out their own racism to them because sometimes they can't see it. Um, but but if you say, like in one of these discussions once there was a white guy who said, you know, I I wait for a black or brown person to tell me what racism is. And I'm like, so Candace Owens telling you what racism is, is that cool? Well, not her. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I wait for rich white liberal women to tell me what racism is by telling me which black or brown person to, to listen ask to. About racism. <laughs> by the way, when Kanye West did a bunch of comments that were very anti SJW, I don't know if you remember that. I, there was there were a spate of like the response in the SJW world was like, what do we do? He's a famous black guy. We can't disagree. Like a bunch, I saw a lot of white SJWs kind of silent because they always wait for their marching orders because they don't, again, they don't form their own opinions. They don't, they don't. They're not actually engaging in thought. They're waiting to be told what's correct and what they should avoid saying to look at what she had here, what they should avoid saying. Um, they just so, need some other black person to tell them yes. why it's is bad and then they can retweet. Yes. And so immediately, like they were quiet for like a day and then there were a spate of opinion pieces where, uh, from uh, black SJW saying, here's why you can dismiss what Kanye said and why you can write him off and make fun of him. And then then they're then they're set. Then they can share that opinion piece and be like, here's why what he said doesn't matter. They have all these like weird internal contradictions, but always listen to black people unless another black person in the ideology tells you not to. Yep. I you know, this whole lived experience thing, which sounds like it's related to standpoint theory, um, uh, which is what Jason was talking about in here. Um, in, in the chat, the, this is actually another attack on epistemology. So, so remember I said, I was talking about reason and evidence, um, actually standpoint theory, it's th the whole lived experience thing is actually even more of an attack on metaphysics than epistemology. It's even more fundamental. It's this idea that there is no one true thing, uh, other than their political goals. There is no one <laughs> kind of true reality and that your lived experience is truth. And this other person's lived experience is truth. And there's no, there's no recognition that there's an objective reality and we can take as your, as we can take your lived experience as a piece of evidence and try and put it in a broader context and be like, oh, um, actually that's atypical for people of your background. You had an atypical experience or that is typical or these are the things that are common and these are the things that aren't common and this is what reality actually looks like. Part of part of objective metaphysics is this is it is an agreement that hey there is one reality and we're all trying to talk about and identify the same thing. And so if we disagree, we have we use reason and argumentation to try and figure out like hone in on what the actual truth is and maybe meet and find like, here's the truth. But if you have a philosophy, so this is, the, they use philosophy because they have particular political goals involving power. And to get to those political goals, they need to destroy good philosophy. And so they, they do that by saying, oh, well, lived your lived experience is unquestioned. You can't question this person's lived experience. Why? 
because that lived experience is reality. There's no, there's no like metaphysical discussion about whether that's an accurate representation of reality. It is, and this other person's is also, and anyone's is, so long as it pushes towards the power goal that we want politically. All the, but Candace Owen, her, her lived experience, that's not valid. Um, so it's a, it's a destruction actually of metaphysics fundamentally and epistemology. It's, it's, it's really, this is really just a philosophical attack and they need to attack that philosophy because any kind of rational philosophy would debunk all this crap instantaneously. So they need yeah. just philosophy bulldozed so yeah. that they can just get raw power, raw power, raw power. That's what they need. Yeah, I, I love the way you explain that. Um, and power is exactly what's at the root of their ideology. As well, I learned that from you, the rest in power thing that you power. brought up <laughs> like oh yeah they're just usually people tell you what they want uh they're actually very clear about what they want power they talk about power all the time and and i know I, we repeat ourselves for people who watch us regularly but i know we have a lot of new viewers now they are it's a form of marxism this whole sjw thing we're criticizing is a form of marxism but instead of being based around class, they view they view this uh, the world as a competition between groups, but not based on class, based on these identity groups that you're in, and the, and based on power. And they assign power, they define power by, by which identity groups you're in. But what they want is power. That's what they worship when they die. When SJWs die, they say rest in power. They don't say rest in peace. It's like they, they, this is the central thing for them. But. I, I really... And as, uh, what, what's his name, Yuri Bresmanov or whatever, as, as he pointed out, uh, none of these SJW uh, grand wizards or uh, priestesses, high priestesses of social justice, they all get shot when the actual thugs take over. They're just, they don't know this. They think they're going to be in charge with all their power. Their job is to, is to dynamite society, blow it up and prepare for their, their little Marxist utopia, but they're not gonna be in charge. That when you, set, when you have a system where power is the standard, Attila the Hun rules. So the most psychopathic, power hungry, merciless, sadistic person wins. And that person will come in and just shoot all these people because you know their job's done. They don't need him anymore and they just threaten his power. So over. That's why you end up with- totally right. I, and I'm sorry I, I didn't find those tweets. If somebody in the chat knows what I'm talking about, please pull them up. But um, that happened to Robin D'Angelo. She was in some Twitter spat where she wasn't pure enough. And then she had to bend over backwards it, again. Like they, they, you're never woke enough. And, and they view, so here it's a catch 22 for professional SJWs. Cause you get someone like, like Tim Wise. Okay. Tim Wise is a white male SJW. He writes and lectures and tours and talks about racism and male privilege and all that stuff. He's, he's the wokest of the woke. Well, so what happens to him? He gets criticized. For, Why is it a white man that's making all this money off of talking about racism? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so anyway, I, so I, um, this might be a short, we might actually stick to like an hour for this deprogrammed, but I have something I want to share with you. No, oh. it's just, I feel like I don't want us to go go on too long beyond what needs to be said. But well, okay, before I, I show this, the comments. Yeah, by um, the way, I'm like, people want us to talk about stuff, throw it at us in comments because I'm happy to, you know, you guys have interesting uh, angles and takes on some of this stuff, so. Yeah, so. Oh, what were you gonna say, Carrie? I'm, I'm trying to, so every one of the comments is like agreeing with her, absolutely brilliant i've been guilty oh, you mean the of the facebook comments of, these. of this white fragility bingo right of the white so it's a bunch of white people virtue signaling about how much they agree with her and how guilty they oh i've been guilty of some of these a time or two i'm working on it um you know <laughs> i, I sometimes look, ask for evidence i'm sorry look this would be a great educational device in schools oh well, that's, and that's not the first comment like that. There's a bunch of these saying, I'm going to recommend this for my elementary school staff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, that's not, I hate to say it, but that's, that's not surprising. I think it'll be in school if it's probably already in some schools. Oh, oh yeah. We've, you and I have, have broken down some of the schools that are already teaching this crap. 
They yeah. have, well, but I haven't seen bingo specifically, but maybe it will be. Right. Any. But all these concepts, right? So yeah. here's one. Here's the one I was talking about before. Going to suggest this be used in an equity training for elementary school staff. <laughs> um, here's one from a woman of color, I think. I love this and emailed it to my white husband to keep at his desk as a reminder. <laughs> and then I got served with divorce papers. <laughs> I guess that's that's me imagining the situation. Never I've mind. heard all of these derailments before. Well, yeah, because these are just every response you can think of other than bowing down <laughs> right. in agreement. Like, yeah. I agree, goddess is the only thing not listed on the bingo. <laughs> that's okay, the only thing. Oh, yeah, I agree, got it. Here's one constructive and petty, my favorites. Told you they like petty. I mean, so there's just a level of like uh, bitterness in yes. social justice culture. So here's the one person I saw who disagreed and didn't even disagree. This is this is what happens to people who are kind of loosely in this world before mm -hmm. they get fully indoctrinated and they're asking questions, right? They're trying to understand, okay? Right. Now, I'm sure if you guys have been watching us for a while, you know some of the SJW magic words that are going to get said to this person. But so this person says, Marlene says, uh, truthfully, after reading this card, I would be wise to just say nothing. <laughs> yes, Marlene, that's what they want. <laughs> I have already been shut down quite rudely twice for asking a question. Both times the answer was to the effect, we aren't here to teach you. Yes, that's one of their go-to phrases. To right. Avoid yeah, who wants to have to defend anything? Yep. Yeah, to avoid having to make an argument or defend their opinion. Um, but if you do want someone to understand something, it would help to educate the person. Maybe what both of those people were telling me in essence is that they don't really care if I know or not. No problem. The next time I'm near something like this, I won't take the bait and I'll just look up the answer that I need. It may not give the, the answer the person was given, but they had a chance to give me what they believed to be correct information so I won't have to live in ignorance some people really do want to know now this is a person who seems well-intentioned and doesn't understand why it's like I want to better understand your point of view and but you just keep telling me it's not my job to educate you which by the way is so arrogant as if as if the, the SJW is in a position to educate you like I've got all this knowledge and it's you know it's so silly okay so th then to this response I just wanted to highlight a couple of these they yeah. all re they all reply with the standard. It's not it's not my job to educate you. Um, uh, they talk about emotional labor. Uh, black and brown human beings are not here to teach you about race or the effects we of have race. We bingo card for that because this is. I mean, we should well, just. Make that's my little secret for the end of the show. <laughs> <gasps> Sorry, I didn't realize you should have told me. I would not have blown the yeah. surprise. Sorry, keep also, going. Okay, black and brown human beings are not here to teach you about race or the effects of racism on them or their loved ones. Now, put a pin in that for a second. They're they're simultaneously telling you that only black and brown opinions matter and only ones within their ideology, but yes. it's also not their job to share those opinions or to explain them at all. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How do I get at this knowledge? Other white people who've already been indoctrinated. Um, in yes. fact, there are many books that can do that emotional labor for those black and brown people that have been written by other black and brown people and white people like the person who came up with white fragility guys, white lady. Um, so it goes on and on and telling, tell, they start recommending books like the white fragility book. They like talk to other white people. Now here they go, sea lioning. A couple different people call this woman a sea lion. Sea lion, sea lion is one of their insults and memes. It's, it's a person who asks questions. <laughs> and and to them, rational questions sound like, because <laughs> that's yes. how they process data. Yeah, so it's an, it's an insult. It's like, it's an ad hominem attack. Like, I see. you have a question, you're a sea lion. They sort through their files. What can I say? Well, she's asking a question, sea lion. <laughs> so this, I mean, honestly, Carrie, this is interesting because it's, uh, if, we, if we adopt the SJWs always project uh, premise, which I think is demonstrably true, at least all the cases that I've seen. Uh, well, sea lions just make noises, but don't actually communicate. That's kind of exactly everything about social justice. It's like, make noises, don't actually communicate. Make noises and bully, but don't communicate. Uh. 
Well, so I'm, by the way, I'm sorry, Carter, and I'm sorry people watching. There's, they're working on my, the road in front of my house and it's very noisy and- I, I don't hear anything. Maybe it. people in chat do, but I, you sound fine to me. Okay, cool. Um, can I show you what I made? Yeah, I wanna see what you made now. This is because okay. it sounds <laughs> like we had a similar idea and you actually did it. <laughs> uh, we can put these up and actually I might improve on it before we put it up. All right, but let's let's see. This is, uh, their ideology is a game. So let's treat it like a game. <laughs> this is- <laughs> <laughs> SJW bingo. <laughs> you have no free space in the middle, Carrie. I know I got to add a few more, but I got some of the greatest hits here. White fragility. It's not my job to educate you. One of my absolute favorites. Your opinion is rooted in my oppression. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yes. Uh, sea lions on pronouns, here. Pronouns. Rape culture. Yeah, I think we could probably, there's probably some more we could add to this, but this is good. Totally. Stay in your lane. That That's related to the lived experience thing. You're not allowed yeah. to speak on this. Stay in your lane. Dude, I'll get in whatever lane I want to be in. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> you know, uh, Carrie, this is, a, uh, this is a spot where you and I may, uh, may depart. What? On uh, agreement. But I, uh, someone, Joe Tundra in chat said, said something like this earlier. Uh, I honestly, like if people are using terms like white fragility and whatever, I just don't engage them. I know Carrie, you're trying to like save people from the social justice world and, and pull them out. Uh, I kind of figure it's a, unless it's in front of people publicly and I can have, and save some bystanders. If someone's using the term white fragi fragility, I, they're just not even engaging in rational thought and their their cognitive dissonance is pretty deep. And I don't want to, could I save them? Maybe. It, probably my time is better spent you know, saving someone who goes, white fragility, that sounds like a weird thing. I've never heard of it. Be like, oh, good. You're the person that I'll educate <laughs> because I can inoculate you to all this. You think it's kind of crazy, but you, maybe you're susceptible. I think there's a lot of people that just don't know this. I think people just don't, know this they don't hear this. we disagree but not to the degree that you think i mean i think it's pointless to someone especially an sjw who's died in the wool and engaging in bad faith like it's pointless unless like you said there's an audience and so a lot of the time when i am engaging with people it's it's on a forum of full of white sjws and and people like marlene who asked the question there are people there at various stages of indoctrination someone like marlene I can reach her like I can't reach the people who are in there calling her a sea lion and being bullies and being jerks, but I can reach the people they're ganging up on. And, and I've gotten people who've written me before and, yeah. and who were totally silent, who never joined in the discussion, but then who privately took the time to write and say, thank you for doing that. Like it was really, in, they got something from it and it, and it shows them that like, A, you, you can expose this stuff as BS in front of them and hopefully win them over. But also you can, you show them that it's okay to disagree and that what, the worst thing that's gonna happen, they're gonna call you a bunch of names, who cares? And and it, it hopefully inspires them to disagree, even if not online, but in their personal life or whatever. So I think there's a, I think it's useful. I get what you're saying, but I also think it's useful when there is an audience and the stuff is in the- yeah, no, When there's an audience, I agree. I, I agree, if there's an audience, and yeah. it helps me practice. It helps you practice your argumentation. This stuff is in the schools. If you want to be able to go to your kid's school and say, I don't want my kid learning this crap, it would be helpful if you've already practiced how to argue against oh. it. Yeah, maybe I'm more cynical than you there. I, you'll never win that argument. If you don't want your kid learning this crap, pull them out of school. Uh, you're not going to win. It, it, it's, they don't, because the reason doesn't well, convince them. And right, the but let's say it's in it infiltrates everywhere. Let's say it's infiltrating your job. Let's say it's infiltrating your church. It's helpful to be practiced in, look, we're, you and I are about perfecting argumentation, right? Which is the exact opposite of what SJWs are about. Yeah, so sure. Why not practice it? it? Think of it like a little training school. Yeah, I would say, I would say the time to practice it though is prior to you noticing it, right? I, the reason I'm saying schools are a lost cause 
as I think most schools already have adopted this, but if you're in an organization that hasn't really adopted this or you're, you're a member of some group that hasn't been converted, inoculation works. It's hard to cure the disease, but it's not impossible to inoculate against the disease. If you explain this stuff before they see it, and they and the first if the first time they are called like they hear white fragility thrown back at them they've already heard it from you and they already understand that it's just an ad hominem and they already get all this they're way less susceptible to well, we're we're not in disagreement there i just think it's still good to engage with people in forums like this it's still good to argue with people like in these comments i i think so someone just said i lump sjw's in with the far left uh they are the far left. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I don't, how are they different from the far left? I don't, I think they are the far left. Uh, I also lump them together. Um, they are the authoritarian, like, neo-Marxist, postmodernist left. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, and, and this person also says, they've never seen us truly pissed off. That's probably true. Um, they haven't seen the rest of the country truly pissed off at them. But, you know, my big concern is actually, will you get pissed off the rest of the country or are you going to roll over because <laughs> you're comfy? Because, you know, yeah, Laura, it is coming in 2020. We've said this before. We should mention 2020, Carrie, because I the more I think about this, I've had a few conversations with friends about this. The more I think about this, 2020, no matter who gets elected, we're in for it because that election will be viewed as illegitimate by half of the population, possibly possibly legally illegitimate, but at least morally illegitimate. If Trump wins, the left, first of all, remember, big tech's gonna pull out all the stops. So if Trump still wins, they're gonna lose their mind that they weren't able to control the election. And, and, they're, and now that they've run around for four years saying everyone who likes Trump is a Nazi or everyone who would vote for Trump is a Nazi, they're going to literally think they're in, a, in Nazi Germany. They're going to go even more Trump derangement syndrome than they have in the past, which is going to be a mess. But if Trump doesn't win, everyone else is rightly going to turn around and look at Google and Facebook and Twitter and go, are you manipulating our elections now? Or now it's not even a legitimate election anymore? Because you assholes are search like ranking search results and changing autocompletes and sending out reminders to demographics that you like. We already know Jeff, um, not Jeffrey, oh, poor guy. Last name Epstein, unfortunate last name, Dr. Robert Epstein, unrelated to Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, Robert Epstein has talked about this. He's testified in front of Congress about this. He asserts that between 2.6 million and 10.4 million votes were shifted to Hillary Clinton by Google in 2016. He gave testimony to that effect. And I don't know if you saw, Tim Pool did a great video where he pointed out that the New York Times read a, ran a headline that said um, something about Trump uh, insinuates that Google could be swaying the election with no evidence. The, New York Times, the, right. there's evidence. <laughs> yeah. This guy, by the way, Robert Epstein, Hillary voter, like vote, like adamant Hillary supporter, Hillary voter, like totally not into Trump. Like 30 years has been a like behavioral psychologist or something like that and spent the last six and a half years doing, uh, investigating exactly big tech's, in, like how big tech can influence this. He's done experiments. He knows how it can be done. He's simulated Google and done this with experiments with people. He knows he can shift opinion. Like this is all... It's reproducible and it's scientific. And as you said, the New York Times, the, the Pravda of New York is like, no evidence. Yeah. But Marussia. Elva Caro says in the comments, what the left is doing is exactly how you get Nazi America. Yes. Yes, and you're right. I've talked to lots of liberals who don't understand this. And I mean, actual liberals, not like, not like F SJW leftists. Um, th they are creating this the very thing they say they're fighting, they're creating this boogeyman because for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And the SJW left, the alt left, that this, this, whatever you want to call them is so big now that maybe not numbers, but an in influence and power, power, which they, they right. worship. So they control academia, they control entertainment, they control like every cultural institution. Control the media, they're, they're starting to control the democratic party. 
they control big tech, they control yeah. the public square online, and their this ideology is so um, it, it is authoritarian, but it's on the left. So what happens? And it's racist and it's sexist, and so not everyone is going to be opposing it from a rational center place. You're going to have see people get pushed over to the authoritarian right. You're going to get see people get pushed over to the racist right and to the sexist right and all because that's a response to this. This is pretty small in influence. No, everybody calls out white supremacists. What are you talking about? They, they're just like with um, the inflated gun deaths and all these other these lies that they push that we talk about, yeah. like these false narratives. They're pushing this false narr narrative of white supremacy and white nationalism, but they want it. And I don't think they realize they want it. They want it. They want an enemy so bad. They want oh, to be they, righteous. And 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 they're they are creating it, Carrie. You're right. And 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 I think it's. We can just step back and again, I like to look at this from a philosophical lens. When you when you separate people into tribes, like Joe Joe Tundra in chat brought this up, you know, Martin Luther King's dream um, it was basically colorblindness. You and I both grew up in a in an era in which the goal was colorblind, like start treating people like individuals. You know, don't when you meet someone, you treat them as an individual, not you don't look at their gender or their skin color or whatever. And that colorblindness was the goal. We have shifted. When you shift to a world, which is what this is what the SJW is doing. When you shift to a culture in which people are categorized by tribes based on the color of their skin. So that's the first thing they did. And then the second thing they did is they said, people in this tribe, white, are evil. You're bad and racist and evil and original sin and blah, blah, blah. Well, what you're doing is you have a whole, not a lot of people are going to look at this philosophically and go, yeah, actually, shouldn't we get back to individualism and colorblindness and blah, blah, blah. They're going to go, oh, we have to be separated into tribes. I accept that premise. The second premise is I'm in the evil tribe. Someone's going to come along and go, hey, guys in the evil tribe, you're not evil. You're superior. You're better. They're evil. And they're gonna go, well, if I have to be in a tribe, should I join the group that says that tribe is evil or should I join the group that says that tribe is superior? I'll take the superior one. And that's how you end up with Nazis. You're gonna end up with actual Nazis because of the social justice left because that's the dynamic they're setting up. Yeah. It's like that, uh, that post I've talked about before about which speak of another book I wanna read, um, Days of Rage. But there's this great review and kind of blog post about it that came out in January of 2017, like right after the election. And a lot of the predictions that guy made have already come true. But one of the things he was talking about, I'm, I'm going to mess it up, but it was it was this 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 sort of thing um, where if these soldiers are told the punishment for being late is death and I can't remember what the other option was, is it's death also. So it's like, well, then I guess I'll just be late because either way, it's death. Does that right. make sense? Like yes. either way, you're going to call me a Nazi. Like there's a lot of people that it's like, wait, you're already calling me Nazis. You're already calling me all this stuff. I'm not. Now there are people who have varying degrees of stability who, yes, it's like, well, you're already calling me that. How far of a jump is it then for some people to make that move? I have a friend who her post, she's, she started out being, um, I think she used to be an SJW too, and became kind of anti SJW, became unwoke became very critical and then and then in the past you know year or so her post veered off into white identitarianism and i was like wow it was really crazy to watch it happen in front of my eyes but i'm like i understand it i'm not going there i think it's wrong and ridiculous i understand sjwism too and i think they're both two sides of the same evil coin but um but, but if you're gonna be if you're gonna accept tribalism then and, and you're gonna you know, have tribalism based on race then you're gonna end up with racial warfare by different tribes like that's that's where this goes elva caro makes a really good point here though and i don't uh i just want to tease it out because uh maybe it may, maybe it's clear to everyone but i, I think it's a super interesting point so he's saying social justice warriors uh their actions lack reciprocity without reciprocity you take away reciprocity based on cooperation that leaves people with generic or genetic cooperation this is human biology this is in their dna so like 
this is this is really interesting, right? When you when you don't have consequences um, for your actions, and when you when you don't have that reciprocity in relationships with individuals, like oh, you do this, and here are the consequences, and I do that, and blah blah, blah then um, you can't have cooperation based on reciprocity, which is kind of how individuals would would cooperate with one another. And you do need some kind of cooperation. So he's right. You fall back to cooperation based on genetics, which is kind of biology. Like that's how we evolved as genetically separate tribes fighting each other. <laughs> like all animals evolve that way pretty much, especially if they're competing for resources or whatever. So, um, you know, I we all thought that we had used our big brains to move beyond that and identify, hey, how about we treat people as individuals and not separate ourselves into these skin color based tribes and fight each other. But I guess we haven't evolved. I mean, some of us have, but it's really tempting for a hell of a lot of people to fall back on tribalism based on race. And yeah. here we are. And and for the the white woke SJWs, this this really crazy phenomenon happens where they can never join the other tribe, but they they start. It's like this weird um, forever seeking absolution from their the sin of being white, like like that Patricia Arquette quote uh, text that came. Or no, was it Rosanna Arquette? It was Rosanna Arquette. Yeah. Rosanna Arquette, and she just tweeted something about how she feels deep shame for being white, and it's just so weird and gross. I I, I said this at the time, but it reminded me. I had this boss. Oh my gosh, in the entertainment world, this she became a woke SJW while I was working there. In in part, I feel like some of that was my fault because I had just graduated college and I was like a little SJW um, <laughs> evangelist. And <laughs> right, and um, we were successful at using, and and I continued to do this in my career, um, using the ideology to sell comedy clients. Like so. Uh, we would take a comic like Margaret Cho to a college and we would get in touch with the women's groups and the, we would get in touch with the Asian group and the LGBT group and people of color. Group. We'd get in touch with all these different identity groups and help them. They would pool their money and the entertainment group. So you get a lot more. It was very lucrative being an SJW comedian um, at colleges anyway. And kind of like I, I continued to leverage, like I worked with a lot of SJWs, professional SJWs in journalism who would promote my clients. And, you know, you give them access to their favorite comedians and they write positive blog stories and articles and, and whatever. Um, but um, anyway, that first boss, she became, she was an older white woman. She became woke, but she was always like, I always viewed it, even I was a true believer and I viewed her as being whatever it takes to get power and money. So I, she was more, I always, I even said back then, I was like, I don't think she's a real feminist. I think she's an opportunist. <laughs> like, <laughs> but so she was so creepy. She, this white, I know this is an anecdote, but I will wrap it up soon. She said to Margaret in an elevator once, uh, we were going, I think we were at like Letterman or something. We were so backstage somewhere and in the elevator and Margaret was talking to some black guy who got on the elevator and then she's, and then he gets off and then she says to Margaret, she's like, I just, I just hate being white. I just, I just wish I were a person of color. So you guys would know I'm one of you. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think Margaret rightly recoiled and so did I. I was like, what is wrong with you? And, but she was like that. And she had, um, it, like at, at Christmas time, she would throw Kwan a Kwanzaa party and dress up in kente cloth. And her, this black comedian we worked with was like, oh, like, I don't want to go over there. <laughs> and she would look up all these like African games to play. And it was just like, it was like pandering to him or something. It, but it was this real like self-hatred too about this weird phenomenon that develops of like, I hate being white. I really, ew. It is pandering and it is and it's ultimately racist and it's ultimately condescending because the entire ideology, you can pull up that bingo card, like you said in the that tweet that you shared, like that person was saying in the tweet you shared. This is the this all rests on the assumption that people of color can't deal with arguments, facts, reason, disagreement, like normal, rational things that smart, rational people engage in in order to ascertain the truth, like they can't handle it. So you've got to put on your kid gloves and 
you know, be sure to not upset them at all. Otherwise, you it's right fragility and blah, blah, blah. But it's it's really just pretty insulting to people. Yeah, but they're never, it's insulting to people of color. It's insulting to white people. It's insulting to everyone because you're reducing yeah. everybody to these groups. But the weird thing is the people in these, like my old boss, the people, the people who subscribe to this belief system who are in the so-called privileged or oppressor groups, they can't get out of that group. Like the best, the best they can do is to be some subservient, like slave to the ideology, like a puppet for the ideology. Right. It's weird. I don't know. Anyway. Well, yeah. I mean, I think there needs to be a lot of self-loathing. Yeah. Uh, in order to be, be there, which is, it's just one of those questions again, that we ended up talking with Gina Gorlin about, which was like, <clears throat> is it the psychology that is it the broken psychology that comes first and then the adoption of bad ideas or is it the bad ideas? And, I think the conclusion that we kind of reached in that discussion with her was ultimately your psychology and emotions, not maybe in the moment, but are ultimately driven by the, the ideas that you accept. And so you have to have ideas that you've, that you've accepted with bad premises in order to kind of routinely be this emotionally vulnerable and psychologically vulnerable to this stuff. So. <sighs> and these people are vulnerable and that's, it's interesting when they, to take to wrap it up or bring it back to white fragility at the end yeah they the people who are using that kind of as a uh, magic word in conversations the ones with good intent it's like i try to be i'm not always they i've been told i'm a, i'm too aggressive in the way i speak but <laughs> you are you joking yeah no they say i'm very aggressive actually I no, no, not online. Sometimes I'm not. And, and I'm not being me. I don't use ad hominems. I don't attack them. But I've been warned. I was warned in one of the groups I was in. And I said, well, how did I violate any? I don't, I don't actually, these people were calling me names and stuff. What a, I was being pretty respectful, but they view it as aggression because I have strong opinions and I'm not afraid to speak them. It's aggressive, you know? And so anyway, they're very fragile, these people, the ones who are calling others like white fragility. A lot right. of them are very fragile. And so it's like, I try to keep that in mind. Like they're like well, one which, poke yeah. away. Yeah, which is good because uh, uh, ultimately they're not actually, the truth is these people aren't actually worthy adversaries. If you just grow a spine and stand up, they're pathetic. Their ideology is pathetic. They're racists. They've got psychological issues. This is not hard to defeat. It's only hard to defeat if you've got no courage. Stand up and argue. Um, and it's why also if we don't stand up and argue and you don't fight them and they win, some tyrant will defeat them because the tyrant will come along and like just, just you know, floor with them because yeah. they're pathetic. Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's, let's, let's wrap this up. Yeah, Carrie, thank you for doing Deep Programmed with me again today. Uh, I know you got to go. Uh, oh, thank you for doing deprogrammed with me. If there's anything else in chat, people tell us if there's anything else we want to talk about, but yeah. Um. Uh, book club. Somebody says with enough, with people like Jordan Peterson, do you think enough people are waking up? I think people are starting to wake up, yes. And, and not just, yeah, Jordan Peterson, you've got uh, Brett Weinstein, um, or is it Weinstein? It's Weinstein. I think it's Weinstein, Brett Weinstein, uh, Jonathan Haidt, like all these professors. You got Camille Paglia, you know. It's still a good question, though. Like, so Jordan's philosophy isn't great. It's okay, and he reckon, but he he's really good at communicating some of the stuff that he's really good at. Like, he's really good at some some stuff. Uh, but I don't know what enough means. Like, enough to defeat them and take the country back. I'm a lot more cynical than Kerry is. Like, I would say, nope. No, there are not enough people waking up to take the country back. Are there enough people to uh, keep part of the country free from it and maybe survive as an alternate entity? Yeah, I think so. Um, but but well, Carrie, she, I think she thinks maybe we can save the country. I don't know. No, I don't know. Some days I'm pessimistic. But I don't even have an. I, I don't. Whatever. I'm more interested in just like how people are changing in response to this ideology. And yes people like Brett Weinstein and Jordan Peterson and 
Camo Paglia and Christina Hoff Summers and Deborah So and Gad Sad, you're starting to see all these different thinkers emerge who are helping people articulate what's wrong with this belief system. Because sometimes that's the hardest part is like, you know, something's wrong with it, but you can't really figure out how to put it into words. And um, all those people, especially Jordan Peterson, were definitely instrumental in waking me up, a former SJW, an SJW of 20 years, right? And so I, I, I feel like there are more people. I meet, I meet former, other former SJWs every day now like online, I'm meeting more people who used to be in the, this cult of belief. So is that encouraging to me? Yes, because it didn't used to be anyone pushing back against it. I never heard, it was the new thing and it was pushing back against um, this other, like, like let's just take this little microcosm I was in of entertainment. Right. So in comedy, right? It's, it's, there definitely was this boys club and there it still is to, to some degree of, of in entertainment. And there definitely was, it, it, it you know, I was representing um, comics who were in all these quote marginalized groups like um, women, people of color, like gay people, trans people. And it definitely was a, a hurdle to cross when I first started doing it because that wasn't the com that wasn't the predominant comedy. It wasn't the old boys club comedy, but then it became the predominant kind of comedy. And now it is the predominant culture. And it's, it's better to be in a marginalized group to, get, to sell a show or to sell a book or something right now. Like it's just, it's better. And so um, now, now that that's become the status quo and now there's something pushing back against that. And that's individualism, I think, is it's like, wait a minute, maybe this wasn't the way to end the old boys network. If the old boys network is wrong too, and, and let's say whatever, substitute whatever it is you're in whatever right. sphere of work you're in or whatever, sexism and racism are wrong. Well, hey, guess what? Sexism and racism, it's not the way to fix that. Um, so now maybe we can go to this other option, which is individualism. Yeah, I mean, someone wrote in chat, until we're able to articulate an opposing view without jeopardizing our career and social standing, we cannot win. I, and I, I don't think, I think that's partly true, but like we are able to articulate it. Articulating the opposing view is very easy. This stuff is not rocket science. Like there's been volumes and volumes written about individualism, individual rights, why it like the, the, the philosophy here is done. This isn't like, we don't have to invent anything. Come we on, come on. Push back. The problem is we are still in a culture that's controlled by this. And like, they won't like, where on that bingo card does it say like, oh, but if they articulate a position that's a reasonable argument, then you can let them, like, no, they're not, they don't, articulating a position isn't the problem. The problem is we've got a, we've got a culture that doesn't want to hear an opinion, like an opposite opinion, like, and that needs to change. Well, no, but it, no, but you're, you're partially wrong there, Carter, because it's not oh. as easy peasy as you say. I mean, I think that that's really, um, you're operating from a place where you were never in this belief system. So it it is incredibly difficult for people to wake up from it, first of all. But I didn't it's also, say wake up. I said no, articulate a position. Those no, are two but, different things. But no, but that's no, it's the same thing because I couldn't articulate a position against it because I was like in them. And even when I start to leave it, it took me a while to be able to art. That's why we do deprogram to try and figure out how to make these arguments. No, no, no you're misunderstanding, Carrie. Okay. We articulating position, we being us, non-SJWs, we can articulate a position very easily. SJWs can't understand, like, the, the problem isn't that we can't, it's not that we, we're grasping for counter arguments to social justice. That's easy. It's, it's getting people, as you say, to, to move the elephant because it's the elephant that's driving, not the rider. It's figuring out how to get social justice warriors, people who are in that, or, or susceptible to it, it's, it's figuring out how to move them and, and, and communicate that position to them in a way they understand. Not necessarily just articulate it, but communicate it to them in a way that understands. Because articulating it, I, I, I maintain, is, is trivially easy. I disagree. It's not easy to articulate. Like Laura said in chat, I knew something was wrong, but I needed data. People, people don't know how to make these arguments, even though they know something's wrong with them. And so I don't think it's just some, oh, it's innately easy. We know how to make, I mean, <laughs> we know how to articulate it as something against it. No, it's, this is a learning process for me. Okay. I think it's easy peasy, lemon squeezy. <laughs> okay. this is individualism, read some John Locke, some read anything anyone's ever written about an individualism, like read any decent philosophy. This is, it's, 
This stuff is actually, social justice philosophically is weak ass shit. It is weak. There is nothing, there's nothing intellectually difficult about it. It is weak ass shit. Don't be afraid of it. I agree with that. I agree with that. But people need to hear anyway. Anyway, we're, we're mostly in agreement. Fair. I don't know. Whatever. Now um, let's I, fight. I don't want people to be afraid of it. But, but the point that I agree with that this person was saying is we are in a culture in which if you can articulate it, like we will get called Nazis for articulating anything that proposes social justice. If we, if we go out and say we believe in individualism and this is why social justice is bad and this is what's morally wrong with it and this is why – there's, we're not in a, we are still in a culture where if you work at Google, you get your ass fired. And that need, that is a problem. And that's why I'm a little bit more pessimistic about having massive change in the country. It's not that, it's not that there's like, not the technology, so to speak. It's not that there's not tools that you could use to explain your opinion. Like we can explain it, but explain it, it gets you banned. You're in like this kind of weird authoritarian universe where if you dare speak against it, you're out. I agree, but that's that's why more people have to speak against it and articulate and, and learn how to and practice arguments against it that are effective arguments and concise and easy to understand. And because then more the more people that do it, then the safer it gets to do that. And look, we, you and I, it's safe for us to do this because I already gave up my career. It's like, whatever. Like, I couldn't continue to represent SJW comedians anyway. And- you made you made the decision. You knew you weren't going to be able to go back to Silicon oh, Valley. I, by the way, I am on I am on boards and advisory boards of startups, where my conversation with the founder it's explicit. Like you are a secret board member. We can never tell any. We want you on board. I have experience. They want my advice. They want my help. We can't tell anyone that you're on board because if they look you up, will we will just be destroyed. So I'm like a secret advisor to come. To a bunch of companies because I'm I'm toxic in Silicon Valley now for simply stating basically all I'm saying is like hey let's use reason and evidence and have a rational discussion to arrive at the truth and that's the crazy thing and they're like hey we don't want a Nazi on our board that's right <laughs> right I'll, and then they call secretly call me up I kind of do want you on the board just don't can we not tell anyone I'm not gonna put you on any decks or anything I'm like that's fine fine but that's the world that's the world we live in and um, that's why I think actually, Carrie, I, my suspicion here is that it's not that we need to figure out how to logically explain to social justice or, or those susceptible people the data. It's that you talk about this all the time. It's the elephant that's driving. We need to figure out how to emotionally connect with them in a way that they kind of, they can kind of are open, they're or even open to argument. Because I think right now, they're not, I mean, you can see from the bingo, they're not open to rational discussion about this stuff. It's, it's very emotional and you've got to somehow steer that emotional elephant in a direction where it's open to you making some kind of rational argument. Yeah. Um, not to belabor this point, but like Marianne said, it's not easy for me to articulate arguments either. Their tactics are emotionally manipulative and devious. My whole point is I just don't want people to feel like if if this particular, if making arguments is, doesn't come naturally to you and if it's not easy, you're not alone. It took me, and it's still, that's why I do deprogrammed is to try and figure out how to make the best arguments and the, the most easy to understand arguments against this belief system and arguments like you're saying, Carter, that speak to their elephant and show, which is a phrase we borrowed from Jonathan Haidt, which I love. Yeah. And um, and that also to borrow a phrase from, Ar uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Arthur Brooks, um, to show them that we have a common why, that we have the same why, but maybe different what's on how to get there. Um, anyway, and, but don't be afraid to try and do this. And, and you know what, sometimes give them little clips of people you like who make a good, like, oh, Tim Pool said this in a way that makes sense to me or, share our clips with them or any anybody you watch who 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 helps like like in our uh Kefefe this morning which isn't out yet but we showed a clip from Colian Noir who's a gun advocate and I like his videos because he gets like right to the heart of something real fast and yeah yeah and and Carrie like the thing that I think is I that I think is easy which I understand maybe is not easy for a lot of people like 
I, we could have whole discussions. If you guys want to have chats where we like, we talk about how to make logical arguments about stuff and you've got questions about like, how do I articulate a logical counter argument to this thing? We can have that discussion. I, I think it's fun and I don't think it's that difficult, frankly, but the really hard thing is what you're talking about, Carrie. The thing I have no idea how to do, and may, maybe some people know better than I do how to do, but like it's steering that elephant. Like I, I know how to make an argument that I think is logically sound usually. How to well, get- here's one way. No idea. Is, is to be more empathetic in understanding that not everything is easy for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> like it is, I'm, I'm yeah. All right, all right. <laughs> Ah, today was fun you guys Seriously, thanks for Jasmine. i am the guy behind the curtains yelling around and i don't know what i'm all right <laughs> thank um, you guys for joining us do you have anything yeah, you want to add everyone we'll be back next thursday same time and obviously back for coffee tomorrow please don't forget to like subscribe share uh i want to mention something that you mentioned this morning carry on coffee which i don't think we recorded but uh this this part won't be in the coffee just to be clear if YouTube was fully monetizing us right now, even with our following, we could totally pay for all of our expenses. We could probably hire a an editor to do like edit videos. Like we would be doing pretty well. As it stands, almost every single video is demonetized. And we've tried, like I've not sworn, swearing seems to not be related to the demonetization. It's the subject matter that we're talking about that they demonetize. So as a result, you know, it's like 20 bucks, right? So what, what do we say this morning? Know, if you like what we're doing, please go to Subscribestar and like throw a couple bucks our way and and hopefully we will make up for YouTube's basically manipulation of the narrative. This is gonna, This I think one part of this is gonna be a Kefevi, the part about Subscribestar, because we were talking about how one of Carter's friends says that my camera, my whole setup is so crappy, I look like I'm one pixel. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, so uh, we also have set a date for book club. We'll be doing a video about it, but just if you guys are curious, the next book club is we're going to be discussing George Orwell's 1984 on Sunday, September 8th at 5 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Yay. And by the, and I love you guys in the chat. There's Look at this. Book. People in the chat are disagreeing. Oh. With who? They're Each disagreeing. Other? Yes, but they're doing so in a way that this is constructive and civil. And then this guy, Joe, is like, I might have Peterson wrong. I'll dive a bit more deeply into it. Like, I love this. Anyway. Yeah, look, we might be wrong about a bunch of stuff. We just want to have the discussion. We might do it passionately. I might say it's easy and I know what I'm talking about. But if you can counter arguments, like, bring them on. I'm not going to say you're white fragile or whatever. <laughs> demonstrate that we're wrong. Like that's how we get to knowledge. That's how the human species advances. Someone says something and someone else brings in counter evidence and we argue over it and we get to the truth. You that's know, how this works. Carter, that's your white fragility speaking though. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Um, I'll go, uh, I'll, I'll drive into downtown Oakland and uh, look for a social justice warrior and ask them what to think. <laughs> um. Okay, thank you guys. All we right, gotta bye, run. everyone. Have a good uh, have a good rest of the day. <laughs>